Protests in Mongolia, thousands braving temperatures of well below zero to demonstrate against the government. Bordered by China and Russia, the country depends heavily on the two economic powerhouses. So, what has forced people out onto the streets? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. Thousands of people have been protesting this week in the Mongolian capital, Ulaanbaatar. They're demanding justice after the government officials were implicated in a scandal involving stolen coal. Some want the parliament to be dissolved. Others are frustrated by rising inflation and a worsening economy. A lot of us here are students. And what are we working towards? We're spending a lot of money to get our education. Inflation is increasing every day. We can feel it in the price of bread. I'd like to put some of these trillions of two Greeks that were swindled by parliament members into combating inflation or back into the budget. I'm here to fight for our future. I've also missed my school to come here. It's freezing cold. I've been out here for three to four hours and screamed a lot. I will have to go back to school tomorrow. I'm a teacher and pay more in loans than my income. I have come to join the youth who are demanding to expose those people who stole a lot of coal from our country and usurped our wealth. The demonstration itself has a tendency to turn into the wrong direction. I want to be calm. I want to have a very peaceful demonstration. The demonstrators are trying to get one person out today to say something. This is aggressive. Do you think that this will be resolved quickly? It is impossible. Let's take a closer look at Mongolia. Situated between Russia and China, it has a population of around 3.4 million people. Mongolia is a democracy with executive powers held by a prime minister and a cabinet. It's rich in mineral resources and mining accounts for a quarter of the GDP, followed by agriculture. Around 85% of Mongolia's exports, mainly coal and livestock, go to China. The so-called zero-COVID policy there shut the border for months and the economy took a major hit. And the war in Ukraine has increased fuel prices and thousands of Russians have crossed into Mongolia, many fleeing conscription. Now, on Wednesday, the Prime Minister addressed the protesters seeking to calm tensions and appeal for cooperation. We must stay on the same side. Thousands of people who are gathered here are on the same side with us. For justice, the government stands with you. Now, let's bring on our guests. Uh, from Ulaanbaatar is Salungu Bashar Khan, Mongolia's Deputy Minister for Justice and Home Affairs. From Tashkent, Chris Wefa is the CEO of Micro Advisory, a strategic consultancy focused on Eurasia. And also in the capital is Anand Tumartugu. He's the BNE IntelliNews correspondent in Mongolia. A warm welcome to you all. I'd like to begin uh, with the Deputy Minister for Justice and Home Affairs. You just heard your Prime Minister there appeal for calm and ask for cooperation from uh, the protesters. That's cooperation he's not going to get. There's simply too much anger out on the streets, right? Obviously, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, so uh, we are having uh, demonstrations and protests in Mongolia, uh, but uh, we are uh, having a dialogue with our citizens. We are listening to our citizens. And obviously it's a uh, uh, shocking news to all of us that uh, our key uh, uh, state-owned entity, Ernest Tauntla, is implicated as uh, this uh, series of uh, corruption-related allegations. And obviously, uh, the government is working to find a, a, a solution uh, quickly, and we would like to have a, a healthy, open dialogue with uh, demonstrators and with our citizens. And for that end, uh, our prime minister had uh, openly uh, uh, met with uh, protesters, and he uh, uh, invited uh, representatives of the protesters uh, to uh, monitor the ongoing uh, processes related to Ernest Tauntalga. So Ernest Tauntalga is one of the key state-owned entities in Mongolia. It operates at the, one of the largest coking coal mines in the world. And this is a great uh, uh, national wealth. 
And if this wealth is uh, managed properly, it's mm. uh, uh, it's going to bring uh, wealth and prosperity to all of our citizens. But and it hasn't been. That's management. the problem, though, isn't it? It hasn't been managed properly. There is corruption. You say it is national wealth. This is a scandal that could potentially bring down your government. And all your government's reaction seems to be is actually just give us a chance. We, we're quite innocent in all of this. That's not going to cut it, is it? There are ongoing investigations by law enforcement agencies. Obviously, the law enforcement agencies uh, work independently and impartially from the government. And uh, we uh, have uh, faith and trust in our uh, criminal justice system. And hopefully, uh, these uh, investigations will conclude and those who are culpable of uh, corruption will be pers persecuted in accordance with the laws and uh, regulations of Mongolia. And I would like to note that the government was the one who initiated these uh, uh, issues and uh, we put forward these issues uh, in the first place. For example, uh, on 26th of October, the government appointed a special representative at the Ernest Town Talha. Uh, with that, uh, the uh, previous management of the company was dismissed. So uh, currently, the government's focus is to ensure that the no wrongdoing will occur at this uh, company uh, currently and also in the future. So the government is working towards ensuring uh, more transparency at the uh, Ernest Town Law. Uh, we are now working uh, towards uh, having more transparency over the sale of coal as well as uh, uh, transparent pricing, because there are some of the allegations related to pricing as well as uh, transportation-related issues. Well, let's get, so some reaction. The... let's get some reaction to that. I want to go to Anand uh, Tumurtugo, who's one of the journalists covering uh, this story in uh, Ulaanbaatar. Ever since the beginning, I have to say, this isn't just about coal and the government's response to this. There are deeper issues, aren't there, here? Yes, exactly. There are, there are many deep-seated issues uh, to, to the protests in Mongolia that is happening right now. Uh, uh, and uh, this, uh, this um, scandal is, is one of the things that uh, actually animated the public in, into anger and rage. And, uh, um, uh, uh, the, and these, um, I don't know if the, the corruption scandals are, are true or not, because, again, the, the uh, as as deputy minister has pointed out that the, that the government actually pointed this out and most of the information about this coal theft is not uh, public is not is not readily to the public but they did announce it and uh, they did announce there there was a, a corruption and embezzlement uh, from inside the government itself so most of the anger uh, from the people they see is that they the government people know who these people are and they are they probably know that the, the, the people who are involved in, in this theft are, are the people uh, who, who basically announced and, and maybe are making a play uh, uh, in, in terms of trying to get uh, more power f for some of the politicians or, or to get rid of them. And, and the public see, th see this as, as, as just, uh, a, a, a just trying to make a mockery of, of the people uh, and uh, that they see that uh, they need actual names of, of politicians who are actually involved, and the, and the people who are who are named, uh, who who might have been involved in in the uh, in the theft, are, are not enough. They see that. But and Anand, some of the Anand, people I'm just see... going to I'm just going to get you to clarify a point here. It sounds like what you're saying, okay. though, is that the government did know, which is what the deputy minister denies. They say the government didn't know, um, but also mm. what you're saying is this may have been an open secret that actually people knew this corruption was going on? Uh, uh, the, the, the corruption probably was going on uh, in, uh, inside the government itself. We don't know. And that's the, that's the issue with, with, with this government. Since uh, 2018, uh, the, uh, this government has made it uh, their admission to make a lot of public information not readily available. They've, they've disclosed it and they've made things as, as government secrets. There used to be... Uh, a lot of information that was readily available to, to the public that was very useful for NGOs, civil rights organizations, but that information is no longer readily available. And, and the government says it's because it's, uh, it's government secret and it should not be broadcast uh, uh, out loud into the public. And 
uh, again, this co corruption scandal of, uh, no, sorry, this the scandal of the coal theft is also one of those things. It's not, the information was never readily available. The government pointed this right. out. And, and we don't know if the numbers are actually true or not, but I, I assume that there was actually some kind of theft. And I, I, I kind of applaud that the government is trying to stem off the, this corruption. But again, the, most of the information was never readily available to the people. And also, again, this this uh, anger is, is not just about this uh, uh, coal theft. It's, it's just about anger of towards a lot of people. As you heard from the people, they, they're living loan to loan. They don't have any, they don't have enough Anand, money we'll, we'll get to into that in a moment. We'll get into that in just a moment. Okay. And Chris, I will come to you in just a moment as well. But I do want to get a reaction from uh, the Deputy Minister. What Arnon seems to be saying is that, yes, you did announce that this coal theft was going on. You say you are looking into it, but also you're hiding behind a veil of secrecy when it comes to releasing information. Are you doing that? Well, uh, today the Prime Minister invited uh, 100 representatives from the uh, protesters so that they can uh, have a, a oversight over the ongoing uh, work we are doing at the government. So we have no intention of hiding uh, 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 material information from our public. But Ernest Hauntalo is a commercial company, so obviously there are commercial relations and there are some of the contracts we uh, we obviously need to have consultations with the counterparties, whether uh, uh, the key terms of the contracts can be made publicly available or not. So there are concerns over uh, commercial secrets, uh, confidentiality between the uh, 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 contracting parties uh, uh, with the counterparties of the Ernest Town Talwa. And also there are also ongoing criminal investigations and uh, law enforcement agencies also have, uh, are bound by relevant laws and regulations of Mongolia. Right. And until they uh, complete their investigations, uh, our comments are uh, restricted. Uh, mm. Obviously, we are fully cooperating with uh, law enforcement agencies, and it may take time to uh, finalize the investigations. And obviously, uh, we have no intention of uh, persecuting anyone uh, without uh, proof. So it's not the government's work to uh, persecute uh, uh, or investigate anyone. So uh, our Deputy Minister, that is, is a, that is a very robust defence mm -hmm. that you're mounting there. But our guest, uh, our guest in Ilan Matar, the journalist Anand, is actually shaking his head at a lot of what you're saying. I will come to you shortly, Anand, but I want to bring in uh, Chris Weefer here as well, who's from uh, Tashkent. You covered this region uh, for a very long time and in a lot of uh, in-depth. Is the government able to investigate effectively itself? Um, no, I don't think that is the case. Um, but, you, you know, just to, a, a quick sidestep for a second. The, um, the What we're seeing now, I think, is the culmination of frustration that's been building up amongst the people for several years. You remember the, the current government, the Mongolian People's Party, won a landslide victory uh, with 82% control of parliament on the promise of economic social reform, essentially uh, uh, promising to improve the lives uh, of people as well as the economy. Now, to a large extent, they haven't been able to do that. To a large extent, it hasn't been their fault because, of course, uh, from early 2020, we had COVID. Uh, and as you said in the introduction, 85% of the exports of Mongolia go to China. So because China has uh, closed its border relatively quickly after COVID, then of course that completely impacted, negatively impacted the Mongolian uh, economy and it's been struggling ever since. And the government simply hasn't had the money or the resources to deliver on what it's promised. So we've had a couple of years of kind of, uh, I'd say weak or poor economic conditions. Um, and last year uh, or this, this year also, of course, a deterioration on the environment. Uh, which has affected people, affected people in Ulaanbaatar as well as in rural areas. So there's a whole accumulation of frustrations over the last couple of years that now appears to have come to a head. And it's going to be really difficult for the government to address it, even if they deal with this particular issue with regard to the coal scandal. The fact is that people have had a couple of years, you know, of, of, of becoming angry and angry over the environment, over the economy, over the lack of delivery of promises. And the government is not in a position to be able to deal with that now because the economy is in a very weak and fragile state 
because of the COVID zero policy of China. And it has a very right. significant volume of foreign debt to either pay or restructure or somehow deal mm -hmm. with next year. And right now, it's not obvious how it's going to be able to do that whatsoever. I mean, Arnand, you did touch on some of those points. You said that this wasn't just about the theft of coal, the theft of a national yes. asset, that this was yes. much deeper than that. There was a lack of trust within the government. We've had the government on. You've been listening to them. She says, look, this is about commercial interests. There are uh, secu secrecy re reasons for good reason. You know, you can't simply just give away an open investigation. That'll have an impact. Do you have any sympathy with those arguments? Uh, th that's that's the same argument that you, they have always given to any kind of uh, information that uh, that journalists or NGOs ask towards of information that uh, that there should be open there should be readily available open data but they're not giving those out they would always give those kind of excuses that there was very similar uh, of what the deputy minister have said it's just uh, that it become it almost become a, a a talking point of those and and i would like to touch upon on those that uh, of, of the of the protest representatives who who would overlook uh, this uh, uh, scandal uh, the working group a lot of the protests that i speak to who have said did not like this they did not like this that the, the that the people who would go uh, in uh, the protester groups because this is not this is not an organized protest and because of that they don't see that the people who would uh, as as a so-called representatives of this protest that will be actual representatives of the people and and they say that no no accountability will be come out of this because they will be behind closed doors and they don't know if, if the people who are say they are representative of the protesters but are Anand, actually representatives. But Anand, you know, Mongolia is a democracy. They do, it does have elections. When you want to change things, that's they where do. you change yes. them. And that's where you change them. You change them uh, yes, elections. Exactly. You don't have to have representatives of the people. The government could just be talking to people who have legitimate grievances. I mean, are you being a little unfair? No, no, I'm, I'm not being unfair. So uh, Mongolia, yes, it is a democracy, but it, it is a flawed democracy. And our elections, even though it's it's fair, but most most of the people who are who are uh, who are politicians uh, uh, who are who are, uh, who are being nominated, they 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 have a lot of financial influence, and a lot of the protesters see that as as an issue that not an actual person who has knowledge or or who has who has actually the um, heart uh, to to see what actually is going on in Mongolia is actually representing them, the, them. And they see that basically, even though they vote, a lot of young people, I asked them, like they, uh, people have criticized mm. that young people did not vote. And, and they say like, we did vote, but the choices that we have is just lesser of two evils all the time. We only, we, and that's, that's basically it's an, their choice. It's an, interesting, have... it's an interesting thought, on and keep, uh, keep that with you. I want to bring Chris Weifer in here. A lesser of two evils. Mongolia is a country that's sandwiched between Russia and China. And they've both used the country in the past to be able to advance their own strategic gains. Do Russia and China currently have a dog in the fight here? Is it the protesters? Is it the government? Um, certainly, China certainly has. The influence of Russia has, has certainly uh, weakened uh, over the last couple of decades. Uh, China is, is by far the, the dominant kind of investor and trade partner, 85% of trade, it's, and it provides most of the money. So the influence of China certainly has been uh, very significant. And of course, there's another uh, reason for frustration for people, because there has been regular uh, protests or objections from people that the best jobs uh, funded by by China and projects in China have gone to Chinese people. And you have had, for example, a situation where uh, Chinese workers are not able to leave the compound where they work because they would be attacked by, by ordinary people, resentful of the fact that uh, Chinese people have to have the better jobs in these projects. So, uh, but it's, we, we, uh, now we can see uh, Mongolia, I, I guess, is in a, a better position, potentially, if they can get through this crisis, better position, because Russia and China are talking about more energy cooperation, about building a power of Siberia 2 uh, gas pipeline uh, uh, across Mongolia, which will bring uh, cheaper gas into Mongolia, as well as transit fees. So Russia is beginning to kind of 
come back into the territory, but it's very dominated by China and has been over the last couple of decades. Uh, Deputy Minister, just a reaction to your thoughts there. Uh, we're seeing a picture being built up of anger and frustration from the people at the, at the Mongolian government's policies. They specifically include, as our guest just said, a lot of jobs going to people who aren't Mongolian. And as our uh, other guest, uh, Arnon, the journalist, uh, said, people are just frustrated at the fact that they don't have a real choice at the ballot box. Do you agree with any of that? Well, as... I would say that Mongolia is an open society and it's functioning democracy. And obviously, there are issues in our society uh, uh, which we are uh, uh, working towards uh, resolving. And uh, obviously, each society has its own issues and uh, uh, problems. And the COVID-19 pandemic uh, brought us uh, challenging uh, times. And we're going through the, uh, these times. And uh, the government is currently implementing new uh, recovery policy that's aimed at uh, uh, bringing economic growth more sustainably and a more inclusive way. And this is uh, supposed to uh, have more broad-based economic growth that will assist in creating more uh, employment opportunities and as a, uh, to create more wealth for all of our citizens. And obviously, it's a challenging time. Uh, uh, but again, the government is working very hard uh, to uh, bring and deliver uh, uh, tangible results to our people. And one of the, uh, so the, this call related issue is not only the first items that this uh, current administration is, uh, government is dealing with. Mm. So first uh, we had the negotiations uh, on the Ayutthaya project, which ended uh, very successfully last year. And we are now looking forward to the opening of the underground mine. Sorry, Deputy Minister, Minister. We, are, we are running out of time. And I understand that, that you, you've, you've said a couple of points I want to bring to the other guests. Let's bring in uh, Arnand here, uh, who's also in Ulaanbaatar. Arnand, these protests aren't going to go away anytime soon, right? Even if the government speaks to the protesters, which they are, even if that happens, no. there's still simply too many other issues that aren't going to be resolved quickly. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. And uh, a lot of people are mainly angry because uh, they see that the issues that they see uh, is that they have way too many things that they give to the government and the government is not giving back. A lot of people that I spoke with talked about the taxes are too high, but they would love to give the taxes, but they don't see the benefits from giving those taxes to the government. They don't see any of the social welfare programs working for them. Uh, very quickly, Chris, uh, if you are Russia or China right now and you're looking at all of this, Mongolia is actually a very important country. We did touch upon this earlier, but I just want to get more into it. Regionally, why is the international community concerned about what's going on here in Mongolia? Well, Mon Mongolia is a, uh, um, it's an important location for, for resources, uh, potentially for rare earth metals. Uh, that can be developed, of course, for in, in the electric industry. Um, I, I think it's it's it is though uh, not really a global issue. It is more more regional. Uh, China is definitely kind of got most skin in the game, as it were, in terms of trade uh, and investment. Mongolia has been broadening out with Russia, with Korea, with Japan, but it's very dominated by Beijing and by China. So I think the the, the capital or the government that would be looking at what's going on in Mongolia much more closely than anybody else will be the government in Beijing. Uh, they will want the situation quelled. They will not want this to develop into something that might then broaden out into Inner Mongolia or to other parts of China. But it is very much a China-focused issue rather than a global issue. I want to thank all our guests, uh, Salongu Bayasir Khan, uh, Chris Weifa, and Anand Tumartugu. And I want to thank you as well for watching. Now, you can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the team here in Doha, bye for now.